Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 14th episode of Insights Webinar. For those of you joining us for the first time, Insight Webinar is a public health webinar series hosted by eHealth Africa. My name is Adana Alex, a coordinator of GIS services with eHealth Africa. I'll be your moderator today for the conversation, the webinar conversation. So today's episode will focus on issues around optimizing geographical information systems, GIS, to improve healthcare delivery. So in May of 2022, the World Health Organization, WHO, launched the GIS Center for Health to manage the production and use of geospatial data and tech systems towards strengthening public health interventions. According to WHO, despite geospatial data and tech systems, numerous medical applications and importance in global health, many countries still lack the benefits of GIS in strengthening their health information system. Technical challenges and bottlenecks are part of the hindrances the, to, opti to optimum utilization of the systems in preparing and responding to health emergencies. The challenges ranging from assessing accurate environmental and demographic information to inadequate technical capacity. But I tell you, above these challenges are huge opportunities for developing countries to explore and, ad and adopt context-specific systems to improve healthcare delivery. So to further discuss this, I have on the call seasoned public health and geospatial experts. But before I introduce them, please permit me to make welcome our Deputy Director of Programs, Dr. David Abba, to give a warm welcome. Please, over to you, David. Um, right. Do we have David on the line, please, for the welcome address? Hello, David. Oh, okay. Right, okay. Um, Maybe we will come back to David when he is available. So we can go on at this point. We can at this point, you know, welcome our audience and um, you can send us um, emoji of how you're feeling being in our midst today. And also to remind our audience that we have um, a Q and A box for your questions, you know, addressed to any of our panel list, panel list here. So while we wait for Dr. While we wait for Dr. David, I will um, go ahead and, you know, so we, we are hoping that um, our discussion today will help map out pathways for government and stakeholders to discuss how to scale GIS in a bid to improve different aspects of health care delivery. So, okay, yeah, so we'll, we'll go on to introduce our panel list at this point. So first on my list, so now our, our panel list are seasoned public health experts and geospatial experts who have designed and deployed various GIS tools in promoting healthcare delivery in various parts of Africa. So first on my list is Dr. Samuel Saidu, all the way from Sierra Leone. So he's a researcher at the University of Sierra Leone and a lecturer at the Community Health Department of the College of Medicine and Allied Health Sciences, University of Sierra Leone. He has worked with Sierra Leone. He has worked with Sierra Leone's Ministry of Health in different capacity. And, and it will interest you to also know that he has been with eHealth. He has been with eHealth. 
in different projects, including Ebola vaccine trial and the famous Avada project between 2014 and 2016. Dr. Samuel, you're welcome. Thank you very much, Ada, and I am blessed to be here. Thank you very much, thank you. So second on my list is Dahiru Hassan, an assistant chief program analyst with National Primary Healthcare Development Agency, MPHCDA. He is also the GIS focal person at the National Emergency Operations Center, National EOC. Mr. Dahiru, you're welcome, please. Thank you, Adana, and welcome to you. All right. Then third on my list is Elvis and so forth, a, GIA, a geospatial intelligence data analyst with the security and geospatial intelligence of the Nigerian Space Agency. He also provides a geospatial support for the health sector as a state and zonal coordinator for the rollout of the new geospatial tracking system, GTS. He's also the focal nominee to the National EOC. You're welcome, Elvis. Many thanks. Okay. Thank you, Adam. Yeah. You're welcome. Yeah. So, um, while we still, okay. So I'm sure our program manager is not able to join us at this time for the welcome address. So we can, so before we go ahead, before we go ahead, I would also like to remind our audience that we have we have a Q&A session um, box. So for your questions, you can drop your questions on the chat box and um, also include the name of the um, panel list that you, uh, you wish to address the question to, please. Thank you. So to, to further go ahead, to the business of the day. So we will um, start off with the discussion. And um, at this point, the first question, the first on my question will be going to Elvis. So Elvis, please, can you kindly help our audience to understand the concept of geographical information system and how it works? Okay, um, thank you, Ada. And Hello, everybody. Um, pleasure to uh, be a panelist on this is the 14th series, I think I had. Um, so very quickly, um, how, um, you know, um, what is the concept of GIS and how does it work? Uh, GIS uh, is a system you know, of uh, integrated computer-based tools, uh, which enables an end-to-end -end processing, uh, including data capturing, storage, retrieval, analysis, and display. Uh, it brings in perspective of the spatial perspective, so location of the Earth's surface, location on the Earth's surface, or interrelation, and then support operations management. So, this is plenty English, but simply put, mm -hmm. GIS is a tool, okay, that enables a more effective and efficient data management. Right. Thank you, Elvis, for that um, insightful. But it ensures it it does this. The fact that everything on something that can be brought in into the design of a GDB, a geodatabase. The GIS basically helps you uh, to capture data, store the data you have captured, do your retrieval, do your analysis, do your interrogation, and then eventually display. How does it, how does it work? Uh, you would always need components, and then you have five components of a GIS. You have hardware components, you've got the software components, you've got data, you've got methods, and you've got people. These components are critical to the working of a GIS. Uh, the software is what basically enables you to manage the data. The starting point, however, is the data. And so 
think about your daily management of information that is data-based, but tying the information that you are collecting to a location. So you're going to have to be collecting the right data to be able to use it in the GIS. So you have to bring in that special perspective. The software is what enables you to play around with that data. The eventual processing, the analysis, interrogation, storage, and all uh, is going to be enabled by the software. But it has to be housed in something, and that's where you have the hardware. So usually you use a GIS on the PC, you know, uh, and so on. And it's always tailored for a particular need, and that's where the, the people come in. And then the method is what guides the team around it. So you always usually use your GIS to solve a particular particular problem. E health is driving this discussion around GIS for health. And so the need in this case, the people in this case, is going to be, of course, everybody, but stakeholders critically operating in the health sector. Uh, how can there be a paradigm shift, so to speak, of data management leveraging GIS or special information and improving? Uh, remember the definition I gave uh, in improving operations, in improving management, in improving decision making, and then even the science. Uh, more or less, so that I don't take so much time. This is GIS, and that's how it works. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. And um, you've used some um, big words that um, I hope our audience who uh, who might not have uh, much um, experience with GIS are able to catch up with this. But I could get, I could get that um, first and foremost, you know, the, the four components that you, you need, you know, hardware, software, data, and people. And then, you know, first and foremost, you said, you know, the right data is, 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 the, is key. You know, and um, depending on the aspect of, of what you want to use um, the GIS for. So since we are talking about health, I don't know, in your, in your opinion or in your experience working with um, um, your special um, firm, do you think that um, for health we have or we are, how well are we doing with um, right data for, for health? Uh, thank you. Thank you, Adana, for that question. Yes. And, and then just to your, your summary, summary was 99% uh, correct. So let me just add that you, you have got five components of GIS. So you, yeah. you got the people, hardware, software. Uh, you, you left out the methods. So methods is yeah, method, part yeah. of just what so, yeah. Yes. Yes. So, so how well have we done? Uh, I work with the space agency, um, the strategy space application partner, and we try to provide special support, uh, several sectors, security, and then for health, I, I'm the focal to the EOC, uh, supporting most interventions. And I've been exposed to different interventions driven by different partners, so eHealth, WHO, the Nigerian government, MPTD, uh, in different states, the different regions, in the, north, in the Northeast, in the Northwest, in the North Central and the South. I think that there is the right handshake going on. The right handshake is going on. It must begin with appreciation and awareness of the importance of the use of spatial data. And there is gradually that appreciation uh, at high level and is beginning to come down. So okay. That's also one of the important things that, would, that is a challenge. Uh, but it's something that uh, has started to be corrected. Uh, there is the appreciation of the need to leverage on spatial data for decision making and then strengthening the health sector. For instance, you talk about when you introduced me, you spoke about GTS, and I think some panelists will speak about it. Thank you very much, Elvis. Uh, you so, see that uh, uh, once upon it, uh, thank you. Okay. Yeah, thank you. So, um, I will go over now to Dr. Samuel. So my second question is going to you. What are the impacts of GIS tools in improving healthcare delivery, especially in local and medium income countries? Good lifestyle, I know the importance. Who tell you? At the first word. What do you want to know? Not be a bad idea. Thank okay. you very much, Anna. Yeah. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I definitely will focus on the health aspect because that's my background. And uh, with some of the experiences I have got with the GIS uh, tools and working around it. 
So um, for the impact of GIS tool in healthcare delivery, especially in low and middle income country, yeah. as um, the initial speaker, the previous speaker just said, all of those components of hardware, software, data, people, method, all of them come together as one. But yeah. it is really important for us to know that it is quite key in terms of the health system delivery. It impacts the health system. It gives the health system some morale in terms of uh, data authenticity, uh, service delivery, allocation of resources, response to emergencies, et cetera. But to really make sure um, we understand few of these areas of impact, to really make sure that we understand few of these areas of impact is one, I wanted to talk about our peculiar issues that we have both yeah, as right. countries and also globally. Disease yeah. surveillance and monitoring. I think that is one of the impact of GIS tool in terms of delivering healthcare services in our poor countries. So the GIS tool itself, when it is quite developed and implemented, it enables the tracking and visualization of disease outbreaks. It helps us as healthcare providers to identify which patterns are occurring in this disease yeah. and then what are the hotspots, what are the trends. The information that we get from the GIS tool itself is very effective for the response of whatever strategy and which kind of resource we can allocate to which strategy and implementation and how can we contain this uh, infectious disease. So that is one impact GIS um, can use or have in the healthcare delivery system. Mm -hmm. But to really move into the um, resource allocation, it helps us to optimize the allocation of healthcare resources. Um, we work in hospitals, some small, small clinics, um, some medical laboratories, et cetera. So all of these uh, um, tools we work with, all of the services we provide, all of the resources we use, we may be able to really know that this is how we can allocate it, you know, by analyzing the population distribution, um, the prevalence of the kind of disease that we are having at the moment, mm -hmm. transportation networks regarding to all of these uh, situations that we have, healthcare facilities can be strategically placed to ensure that better access to underserved communities is being really resourceful in terms of resource allocation using mm -hmm. these tools at the moment. It's definitely, like I said, ensure emergency responses. Yeah. During health emergencies, uh, natural disasters, uh, GIS facilities are very quick to identify um, the effect on these areas, the effect on the population density, the availability of the medical resources in that area, the information would assist to coordinate that emergency response, ensuring that there is a timely medical assistance to those individuals that really need it at that time. You know, the planning and also infrastructural development is something that is really important because as we know already, most of our countries are very poor in terms of health infrastructure. But if we try to adopt this GIS aids, whether mm -hmm. in long term or in the short term planning, we will be able to identify areas with inadequate healthcare infrastructure. You know, mm -hmm. vaccination campaigns, I think it has been used a lot. I think uh, mm -hmm. EHA is using it a lot, especially in Nigeria. Vaccination campaigns can be really be enabled through the GIS tool itself, you know, because the GIS tool plays a crucial role in planning and implementing the campaign itself. It identifies the target population. It optimizes vaccine distribution routes and also monitor vaccination coverages in different areas of the country that we are using this tool. You know, all of this will make sure that there is health equity and health access. So GIS enhances those equity uh, issues and also access issues. You know, we can be able to track and manage patients very well using those yeah. tools. Health education and outreach can be done using the GIS. Research and the data, like my uh, the previous speaker said, you know, we can have data that is actually rich enough for decision making, we can do research and we can analyze the data 
and we can make decisions in terms of policy making. So these are really some of the things that we can have as an impact in terms of uh, the GIS tool in healthcare delivery. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. And um, my audience, I'm sure you will agree with me that um, this is turning out to be a very interesting section. You know, so Doctor has mentioned um, surveillance, monitoring, you know, being able to ascertain patterns and hotspots and trends, right? And there are also allocation of resources. So all of these, you know, GIS has been able, GIS tools have been able to, you know, make, you know, impacts. You know, so thank you very much for that, Doctor. And um, I will also want to use this opportunity to remind our audience that um, our question and answer, our Q and A box, chat box is there. So if you have any question, you know, we also want you to be part of this. So any question you have for any of our panelists, you know, be able to drop those questions, and we will, you know, also be be able to ask them the questions. Thank you. So um. So for my third um, question is um, for, this goes for um, Dahiru. So please, we would like you to share your experience of a successful deployment of GIS tools for healthcare interventions. You know, share your experience with us, please. Thank you, uh, Dana. So, you know, GIS really helped us during the eradication of, of our white polio, white polio virus in Nigeria. As you are aware now, we don't have any white uh, polio virus in Nigeria. Yeah. In the heart of Nigeria, South Africa, because the Polio Emergency Operation Center stands as a testament to the revolutionary power of GIS. You can testify that. Galvanized by the spirit of eradicating the white polio virus, this initiative harnessed GIS technology to orchestrate the triumphant finale of the age old battle which I told you has been won to eradicate the wild folio virus. With the GIS as, at, uh, as our ally, we didn't just strategize, we innovate. Many innovations were stayed, okay. Many innovations, uh, were, were, were many strategies were innovated. Where micro plan, you know, micro is a game changer. GIS emerged as a secret weapon fueled by GIS generated maps. Vaccination teams transcend boundaries, not uncovered hidden settlements that history nearly forgot were all discovered using GIS. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Every corner on the map became a beacon of hope. Every community a triumph. Localities honored by authorities were now eliminated by the power of GIS. Yeah. Like I remember, by the uh, we use um E-Health, with the help of E-Health and other partners, uh, remote sensing was used and uh, future extraction to discover different settlements, which if you take to the localities, they will even be arguing which you know, no settlements exist in this place. So uh, E-Health pioneered the uh, active field, field activity where they went on the field and deployed people to go and verify and most of the futures extracted were real settlements with individual people living there. But it didn't stop at discovery. It propelled accountability to the new highest. GIS precision ensured no settlement went unnoticed, no corner unvaccinated. Through the watchful eyes of GIS, every, every step of vaccination team was traced. I heard uh, my colleague from, is it Ghana? I can't remember, sorry, sir. He mentioned this striking. It was really helpful using GIS. Every mission of health coverage accomplished. We use VTS to track uh, our vaccination teams because they will tell you uh, we've visited all the settlements in our daily implementation plans and virus is still erupting from all corners of the of the state or LG. So the innovation, it was VTS before, but now it has been changed to GTS, was deployed to track their movement and make sure they went to where they're supposed to go and work. And not only that, the, it has so many futures that will tell whether they went there to just pass and mark it or they stopped there to do the vaccination as they were asked to do. And when disease is long, GIS transformed into real time shield. The Ebola outbreak was met with GIS light fast, lighting fast mapping cases, mapping the contacts and also the health heavens. They are all mapped so that. Uh, the case wouldn't go far. And the result, a dance of coordination and resources allocation, where GIS bit dictated 
the rhythm of response in this dead of technology and humanity is geographed a symphony of safety. Resources allocation also was uh, used. GIS help us to position our resources where they are needed. Where population data was uh, overlapped, population data was overlapped on the settlements and uh, settlements that uh, shows highly densely populated settlements, more teams and more uh, resources will be channeled to the highly densely populated uh, communities and settlements. Nigeria's tells of GIS infused victories isn't just about conquering diseases, it's about conquering limitations. The polio emergency centers etch its name in the annals of healthcare history, and GIS was the queen that scripted its success. From covering to coordinating, from planning to conquering, GIS is the heartbeat of Nigerian healthcare times. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Dahiru. I mean, you know, polio was one of our great success with GIS, so I can relate. Thank you very much for that um, insightful um, share of um, successful deployment of GIS tools within the healthcare intervention. So, um, yeah, so I can see that we have um, um, Dr. David, with us. So I, I don't know if you want to still go ahead and you know give a, say something or you know. Thank you. Hi Adana. <laughs> Thank you, David. Yeah, sorry, I didn't want to interrupt the very valid, interesting conversation. Um apologies for joining late uh, okay. guys. Um I think the conversation here really highlights um the importance of just spatial system, um, how we can improve health outcomes, right? Efficiency and all aspects. So um, I would just say that um, we're just listening to all the experiences, the use cases. And I love the fact that we're even not sounding too technical so that we are able to accommodate uh, people who are not uh, GIS experts, right, to really draw out some very great learning out of the session. So thank you very much and uh, yeah, enjoy all the conversation. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. David. That's our um, Deputy Director for Programs. Thank you, David. So um, at this point also, um, let's see, I think we'll have one or two questions on our Q&A. So this is the first one is um, Melissa. It says, how can we implement GIS into curtailing malaria transmission to the point of elimination? Um, but she hasn't um, put um, anyone, any of the panelists to answer this question. So I don't know if, um, no, not Elvis now. Dr. Samuel or Dahiru, I don't know if, and I also have my manager, GIS, on, on the panel list. So um, would you like to um, have a look at that? Um, if you have any, any response to this, please. Should I take the question again? Can I, can I attempt? Yeah, OK, yeah, ahead. sure. Go ahead, sure, sure. So uh, malaria, you know, we this is uh, tied to maybe swampy area and uh, 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 sorry, my phone is ringing. Swampy area and um, swampy area and uh, where water flows and where a lot of garbage and that's where it tied to. I can remember there was a time I think it was in 2018 or 19. There was a virus found in the uh, polio virus before the eradication found in Katsina. And before you know it, there were cases reported from uh, Jigawa State, and they were all tied to that same virus in the uh, Katsina. So the incident manager gave us a task, the data team, to come up with a solution to that. So what we did was the surveillance guys went to the Katsina, the community. I think it's in Aure local government. They took a sample from the sewage, and the virus was there. So and uh, what we did was we came up with the sewage, the channel where it flows. It's flowing down from Katsina to Kano to Jigawa. That's how the water flows. And we come up, we did an uh, analysis. Uh, we buffered 
two kilometers, all settlements within two, uh, two kilometers away from that sewage water were, were, were targeted and or OBR was uh, deployed, the response was done twice. And that's how we interrupt the transmission of that virus. So I think some can be done to malaria. If you know where the malaria, the, the mosquitoes are breeding, we can just do an analysis and get to so communities that are within that area and have, treat, and have treatment done to that area. I think that's what I can say about this. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dahiru. Yeah, yeah, probably just probably just to just to add, right? Of course, um, we get to know that malaria is very, very close to water, related to water. So um there are the analyses and um statistics where we could actually model this breed of malaria, right? And we could actually track where and where the coverage of malaria could be. So what has been done over time is the, the devices, the applications that have these analysis embedded in them. Um, now I don't want to start advertising for <laughs> any two, any two at the moment, right? And what what it does is to um, look at this spread and also look at um, where and where you are likely to have this this um, this um, uh, malaria outbreak. And what um, digital makers get to use that information to do is to look at how can we um, distribute our SMC drugs across these areas. How can we distribute our uh, mighty nets um, across this area to ensure that we are able to reduce um, the spread or the prevalence of malaria across board. Of course, GIS has always played a major role across um, across um, um, disease surveillance, especially when you are talking about um, um, spatial analytics in in modeling of environmental factors um, that um, that affect um, that affect. Um, the, the health or let's say the disease um, pathogen itself. So there's always a bridge between that area, between um, the pathogens of different um, diseases, whether it is malaria, whether it is cholera, whether it is polio, against where they are. And then just have always been providing support, support across for Thank you, Adana. Over to the Thank you very much. Thank you, Busaya. So I see that we have a very lively audience, but before I go back to um, the questions from the QA, um, Alvis, please, can we um, go back to you again? So I have this question, what do you think are the major challenges that have hindered the optimum use of GIS systems for healthcare delivery, especially in Africa? Okay, um, thank, thank you, Adana, uh, again. Now, um, JS, uh, so uh, let, let me let me approach it from the the components I've highlighted. Yeah. Um, <laughs> when you look at hardware, um, uh, you look at costs and standard of living in yeah. Africa, some parts of Africa, you see that it, it it would be a very serious challenge to effectively have the kind of hardware that you're going to use. You're going to need to run. Uh, or use GIS efficiently, whether it is on a PC or on handheld devices. I mean, and I'm not trying to say that it's so bad, but, but this is what it is. Uh, some of it is capital intensive, uh, especially when you want to do high level operations analysis uh, to fully exploit the strength that the GIS can bring to your decision or management process. You're gonna be needing very strong, serious hardware and that's capital intensive, you are not readily available. So points on the first point would be hardware. And then we'd also look at software. Although the world, the world is beginning to shift into open source uh, so that um, you, it becomes more sustainable to leverage some of these GIS softwares and then even build your own code to write on algorithms that you can have as plugin in most of these open source software. So before we get to that capacity, let's even look at softwares. Most of the softwares are licensed. And and, uh, and just like Busaya, let me not call names, but yeah. we know that there are, there are licenses of softwares that uh, are like $100. I mean, uh, not too many families are able to afford, or too many individuals, organizations are able to dedicate $100 for a license for one mm -hmm. system, you know, and uh, you need several of those to be able to fully exploit or leverage the strengths of a GI. So 
software hardware is one of the, some of the issues. Then you look at capacity. Yeah. Now this software licensing issue and availability is not a problem affecting only Africa. It is sustainable globally. And it's part of the reason why there is also that paradigm shift from this licensed software, even though they are more robust, uh, but most people are beginning to advance open source free software uh, so that you can easily just access it, you can download it online, mm -hmm. and then you can, uh, for all the missing applications, analytical applications to start so that you will need it on the software, you can build capacity to write the code. Now we do not, we have not, while the world has really gone so far in Africa, uh, we have started the journey, uh, but haven't gone so far in ability to embrace um, code writing. So embrace AI, for instance, and code writing and the development of um, scripting, so to speak, where we're able to fully exploit this open source software. So hardware, software, capacity, and then of course capacity, you'll be looking at it um, from the method and the people point of view. So capacity has been an issue. Yeah. Also awareness, there is significant improvement in the buy-in. Okay, I, I said at high level, uh, when we are sitting on the table like this, most people are aware of the strength of a GIS and why you should incorporate spatial data, for instance, even into the design of your GDB, uh, even at primary healthcare level, you know, at that lower level. That awareness hasn't gone down, you know. It's you have pockets of it in different places, but that awareness uh, to ensure a total buying continues to be a challenge. And then uh, maybe finances. Finances also, you're, you're, you're also going to be needing finances uh, when you want to solve most of all these problems, you know. So uh, I think, um, let me, because of time, thanks. I'll stop there. Thank you very much, Elvis. Thank you. Yeah. So, you know, from what you've said, virtually the, the four components you mentioned are one of the challenges, uh, you know, major challenges here in um, Africa in delivering using GIS for healthcare delivery. So um, I will um, go on to Dr. Samuel. So please, how can you scale? How can we scale um, existing GIS tools to help achieve more utility in healthcare delivery? What do you think is um, how we can scale up existing um, GIS tools, please? Thank you very much, uh, Ada. I think um, it's a whole component of things that we have to definitely look at at this point in terms of scaling up of GIS tool. I think it's much um, common and similar to most other tools and uh, services that we try to scale up for healthcare delivery system. So scaling up um, existing GIS tool to enhance healthcare delivery in these countries require a lot of strategic and context sensitive approach. And uh, it varies from context to context. It's, it's mm -hmm. not going to be like a, one size fit all in this matter. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that we have to definitely think about is to understand the local context itself. Mm -hmm. So we start by comprehensively understanding the healthcare infrastructure. Like I will tell you for Sierra Leone, what the structure is, how mm -hmm. it's working, what are the challenges we are facing, the resources um, that we have, how we can actually target uh, these resources to specific allocations and all of that. So we consider these factors, um, including the population density, the disease prevalence, the transportation infrastructure, uh, the cultural norms, you know, the society that we live, the religious beliefs that people have. We have to get all of this understanding in terms of context, you know, because there are a lot of tools that we use, people related to different uh, attributes. So mm -hmm. all of these have to be understood. So that background research is really quite important in the form of implementation research. So another scaling up um, factor that we can think about really, if we want to make sure it's being scaled up is the collaboration and stakeholder engagement. So people who are really the stakeholders should be quite collaborative and be involved in the whole process. So yes. local health 
care authorities, uh, the NGOs that are involved, uh, if we have community leaders or chiefs or um, um, maybe government um, heads of government institutions, et cetera. So all of these have to really come together and their insight and perspective will be quite crucial and effective. So if the tool is available, uh, the expert will definitely tell you that uh, it might be it might require some kind of optimization. So you might have to modify the tool. You have, must have to make some few adjustments here and there on the GIS tool itself in terms of scaling up. So you definitely will have to get all of these plans set aside and understand the tool itself. So tailoring the existing GIS tool to specific need and challenge is quite an important aspect in terms of scaling up of GIS tool. Um, the data collection and the integration. So collecting accurate and up-to-date healthcare related data, such as health facility, the population demography, the disease prevalence, transportation network, et cetera. All of these data have to, we have to ensure that it's been accurate. I know maybe when you say scale up, piloting must have been done before here and there in maybe different contexts, different places but you still have to do that scale up in bit by phases so that you will not be able to just have a flashback and then come back to zero where you actually started. Scaling up will also require capacity building. So you provide trainings, um, especially for the local healthcare professionals, because if we want to make sure that these tools are sustainable, then it has to be and ownership and responsibility of the healthcare professionals who are locally based in different facilities. You know, the administrators that are going to use all of these tools, they have to be quite trained and understand all of these tools, their usages, and probably whatever required in terms of troubleshooting and basic workshops, tutorial, support, one-on-one -on -one will be really quite uh, effective. Uh, maybe it can be mobile or web applications. So developing them and also adapting them to make sure that it fit that context is also quite important. And uh, the resources itself that we need, you know, scaling up these kind of um, uh, tools may not require a small uh, amount of resource. So we have to also make sure that uh, when you want to scale up, you think about the resource itself. How are you going to allocate it? Where are you going to allocate it? And how is it going to be used? You know, so it really will be uh, a whole component and an interplay of so many other things. You have to think about the monitoring and evaluation, the health education and the awareness of it itself as you go continuously. Uh, the, the sustainability of it. And when you think about the sustainability, there are a lot of components around that. Um, you have to think about sustaining the hardware itself, sustaining the software. Uh, how do we actually manage the data? Where is it going to be stored? Uh, the human resource, how are we going to look at this method? Uh, is, are the method going to change? So all of these have to actually be thoughtful quite clearly in terms of sustainability. You know, the resources will require partnership and sometimes um, the funding itself will require a lot of partnership because sometimes the government institutions will not be able to provide all of these resources. Sometimes the organization itself, maybe EHA want to actually scale up a particular GIS tool, but the resource that will be involved as Nigeria, we see it's quite large. They will not be able to definitely have that resource or funding to scale it up to that extent. But partnership is quite key in all of this. So collaboration and uh, inter with international organizations, tech companies, philanthropies, et cetera, will actually make sure that all of this will work very well in terms of scaling up. Regulatory and the ethical consideration is also key because whatever you do, people's data have to be safe, secured and protected because some of them are really personal information that you have to protect it. So that regulatory aspect of it has to be very key. The ethical aspect has to be also key. And finally, you think about continuous improvement. So as you go along, you implement, you do your research, you think about it, you reflect on it, 
you find out that there are a lot of things that require regular update and refining of the GIS tool itself based on whatever feedback you get from the users and uh, the technology itself that you are using at the moment and the healthcare needs as it keeps changing from time to time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Doctor. Yeah, so you've mentioned the um, capacity building, you know, for sustainability and also, you know, tailoring um, the needs of the country, you know, the, that needs to be put into consideration also. And then collaboration and um, with um, both um, stakeholders and partners, you know, let there be that synergy, you know. So thank you. Thank you for this, um, um, this insightful um, response. And um, I see we, you know, we have a lot of questions. Okay, but um, let's see. Okay, so um, please, um, Busayo, um, please, how will you rate um, Nigeria and Africa in the deployment of GIS for healthcare delivery? And I, I, I can't find anybody best to answer the, to help us with this question other than you, please. Yes, I, I don't know. If, uh, there's no rating score, right? <laughs> <laughs> But um, um, as it stands, I can I can still say that we we are moving closer to let's say to eighty. Um, reason being that now as it stands, a lot of um programs, let me say, ad campaigns, are now um using um GIS component in one way or the other. Um, I know Guinea Bissau is using Gambia is using um Zambia is using um Seychelles they are they are using Madagascar is also using. Right, so a couple of couple of African countries have um, deployed the the use of GIS application in terms of number one um, distribution of of their vaccine to know where and where is is needed. So in terms of accountability, is there? Um, in terms of um, team distribution, is also a, a major factor to see um, so that you you manage your resource and um, um, some of your resource won't be redundant at at, at the end of the day and effectiveness to ensure that um, the whole area is covered. Um, so for me, I would say 60%, um, Africa is moving, we are actually moving um, there to with full deployment of, of G, um, I want to say GTS now, but of GIS, of GIS, um, of GIS um, across board, uh, because there's, there's a lot of application out there, um, even at different countries, a lot of, um, um, giant innovation tools that are really doing um, a great, great work across across Africa. So for me personally, I'll just say between sixty and seventy. Over. Thank you very much. Thank you. I'll let, I'll, I'll I'll like to add a, 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 a right. uh, The <laughs> development of GIS is at very level in in Africa, with some countries far ahead of others. If you can remember, Busa, whenever you are out of Nigeria, anything, any innovation, if you are in African countries, Nigeria is always the the, the, leading the, country. What, the leading country. All the examples <laughs> will be Nigeria, guest study in Nigeria, everything in Nigeria, we are far ahead of them, but they are still catching up. Yeah. <laughs> so the 60, I told you you're giving the 60 to Nigeria, not to Africa. <laughs> <laughs> so, so we say Africa. So it's um, I mean, Africa, yeah. So Africa, of course, Nigeria is playing a major role, right? Uh, most of the time, even um um, some 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 donors will still want to test the tool in Nigeria before they even go to yeah, other countries yeah. to check whether it's working properly or not. But at the same time, at least I've been across um, some African countries and I've seen some wonderful tools, GIS tools that are really really doing very well, right? Um, although it might be crude, right? But you understand the model, you understand the process behind it. So there's a lot of um, a lot of thoughts now in implementing um, special entity into their planning and and for me that's that's um uh, that's a lot of development for africa thank you very much Busaya. you know so um you know when you're having fun the time runs very fast so let's see if we can catch up you know so um hassan please um how was the reception the people's reception especially state ministries and primary health um care centers with um gis deployments I'm sure you will agree with me that the state ministry and primary health care have a match as the pioneers in adopting GIS tools in Nigeria. I'm sure you will agree with me. Yeah. <laughs> and by leveraging uh, GIS microplans, these entities have embarked on a transformative journey, revolutionizing routine immunization sessions, supplementary immunization activities, and resource allocation strategies, among others. 
The war of GIS has not only ignited improved planning, but has also ignited the flames of innovation and advancement in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. So um, let's see if we can have one or two questions from our Q&A. I think most of um, the questions I see here have been uh, talked about. I know somebody asked how does um, GIS pinpoint the specific position of um, the pathogens in a community? And then um, while um, uh, Hassan was explaining, he made mention of, um, you know, you know, doing um, uh, um building some uh, grids around the so i'm sure that would have responded to these questions so um let's see if there is um and um okay yes so um i'm just trying to see which of the questions we can quickly i think most of them has been answered because there's one i was actually waiting that was directed to um Elvis, I think Elvis has already put in the, the, the response there. Thank you, thank you. So um, before we close, I would like our panelists to have a, take a few minutes to respond to, you know, giving us practicable recommendations that can help tackle existing challenges of GIS in, the, in, in, in Nigeria and in Africa, in developing countries. Um, I don't know who will go first now, maybe Elvis. Yeah, okay. Thank you again, Adana. Uh, um, and thanks everyone for your time to have joined on this call. Uh, oh yeah, okay. A second. Uh, what will be practicable recommendations? One, uh, there is, so much that can be achieved when there is um, some kind of collaboration. So, for instance, um, knowledge access gaps could be closed when there is proper handshake between agencies, for instance, or agencies and private sector. So I know that domicile in some government agencies, for instance, or uh, some private sector uh, is the capacity, GIS knowledge, technical know-how, on how you could leverage or use GIS. The handshake with the handshake that enables the exchange of these ideas, this knowledge can, for instance, something that could be um, leveraged on in the immediate uh, at almost no cost. Uh, if it's going to be a commitment, um, policies can also be set to ensure that, especially at the, the, the PhD level or probably at the local areas there is some commitment by all players stakeholders to start to transfer knowledge or incorporate into their policies and program some orientation somehow on the importance of embracing spatial uh, embracing gis so to speak mm -hmm. and then incorporating spatial data into especially the special perspective into your data collection. And I see a question that was linked to it. You can start small, things like that. Uh, it becomes mandatory once pro pro projects or programs are implemented or operationalized by like policies that there must always be the special perspective. And, and what does it really take? For every time you're going to be collecting every any kind of data, add coordinates. Yeah. So always bring in the special perspective into your data collection. And if the policy, for instance, is set up and it becomes the standard SOP, over time, it just becomes, so even someone who's not literate uh, knows that when I'm going to do this work, I have to find a way if I cannot afford the GPS, I download the GPS app free on my phone and I must collect partial data and add it into this database that is being built. Uh, these are these small, small actions or policy that would enforce it can be one way to go. Um, um, practicable. Uh, I mean, I, this this would help close the gap between uh, awareness and then close a little bit the technical capacity need. For software and hardware, I'm not sure what the sustainable recommendation <laughs> would be. I mean, but partners where where possible can see how they can um, make available hardware at least. You know. 
people should also start to embrace, in my opinion, open source software. It's more sustainable. I mm -hmm. think the world is going to shift towards there in the short time. I'll give the other recommendations for my fellow panelists, you know, so right. thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Elvis. So, um, Dr. Dr. Samuel, please, over to you. Thank you very much, Ada. I think uh, Elvis has made very great contributions mm, of sure, those yeah. practical recommendations. Um, what I, I just want to go back briefly to uh, somebody that was asking, uh, how do you pinpoint using GIS to a particular pathogen? I, in my, in my experience, I am not sure uh, it is really about directly locating the pathogen that this is the pathogen, here is it, we have to shoot the pathogen and die, no. I think it's okay. about understanding yeah, their yeah. distribution, their, their transmission dynamics, the context in which they are, the geography, all of those components is what GIS help us really to understand. Yeah. And once you understand that, then you have to apply your science because GIS is not going to apply any science for you to eliminate uh, a malaria parasite sure. or, uh, or a polio, uh, um, whatever virus is not going to actually do that. But it will help us to understand, you know, where are they distributed? Which population? What is the geography like? What is the trend? What is the dynamic of the transmission? You know, so this is actually what you have to look out for. But adding to Elvis' uh, practical recommendations, I will say you assess your local needs and capacity. Uh, as a country, as a ministry, as an organization, do you have uh, the capacity? What do you need to actually make sure that you are able to uh, have a GIS tool implementation in either a program as an organization or a country or a kind of continent? What do you have? you know, and what do you need? You have to definitely try to look at that. Like he said, open source software. A lot of people, I know people use QGIS, Grass GIS. Try to get an open source software because those are really cost effective and have a strong user community. So you can easily collaborate with other people who have used it before and uh, is easily able to play around it, adapt it to the dynamics of your country you know, make sure that you have um, um, a kind of data available, uh, data that is fit for decision making, um, pure data, not uh, manipulated data. You know, those interfaces are really quite important. Build capacity of the individuals. Don't just do anything by lip service. I will add, I say, I will say, practically make sure that build the the capacity, provide training and capacity building for programs and local staff that you have to ensure that they can effectively use and maintain those systems. Otherwise, you might just be using a lot of money and uh, run away. You know, you have to adapt it, it, internet connectivity or whatever is a serious problem wherever you go in most of our countries where we are. For me, Sierra Leone, I know internet is a big issue. It's quite expensive if you want to use good internet, but try to adapt to limited connectivity. Make sure that um, you design systems that can function with intermittent or low speed internet connectivity, or maybe even offline um, uh, tools that you can really make sure that uh, those can make sure you are able to use those um, resources very well and uh, at a very low or minimal cost to actually implement them. You know, focus on the priorities. Do you have priorities? You know, don't take every aspect of the issue to deal with. Make sure that you have a priority that you focus at and look at that particular issue. And that is what you will definitely do. So like Elvis said, maybe I will try to stop here and then <laughs> give my colleagues yeah. time to make sure that they add some few. Thank you very much. Yeah, thank you, Doctor. We have less than two minutes. Um, so I don't know. Um, Busayo, will you want to in a minute give us um any um practical practicable recommendation, please? Uh, yes, I, I guess uh Bola Paradis have actually mentioned it. All right, okay. Thank you very much. Thank uh, you. <laughs> okay, all right. For me, I'll just advise that uh, 
uh, we look at um, um, training. There are so many online training um, for capacity building and, and development. Um, other colleagues have mentioned open source. That's also yeah. a, a way to go. Uh, but for me, I think it's much more of personal development. Yeah. Uh, if we think there's a lot of article out there uh, that, that talks about GIS. And even at this point, even in Nigeria, to me, the application of GIS is just like two, three percent. There's a lot of things that we can still use GIS for, especially in, even in, in, in the health industry. A lot of modeling can actually happen with, uh, with the help of GIS. So there's still a lot to, to do. There's a lot to know. Um, for me, the research is, is also a core part of it. Um, uh, we need to, uh, let's say, merge the, that research part and also um, the, the industry part together to ensure that we have, uh, uh, okay, yeah. And to ensure, yeah, to ensure that we have uh, we have the, the results that, that we need. There's a lot of knowledge in, in that research section that we are not still um, using at, at this point in, in, in the health industry. That's Thank important. you very much. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Dahiru, will you want to say a word? Uh, you know. Okay. Uh, so we're just uh, mentioning the recommendations, not yeah. mentioning the challenges. So I think yeah. part of most of the challenges, number one, is the training then infrastructure and awareness. Awareness mm -hmm. is, is very low in GIS in Nigeria. So I think okay. part of some recommendation is to invest in training and education, collaborate with local universities and technical institutes to develop uh, GIS expertise, establish public-private partnership for funding and technical support, develop user-friendly GIS interface to bridge gap between technical and non-technical users, and implement data sharing standards and protocols. Improve data quality and interoperability. I had somebody Thank in you. the chat box asking whether data can be used from one source to the other. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dahiru. Um, so thank you, thank you, my audience. You know, you guys are wonderful. You know, we had you know a lot of people, almost a um, hundred participants. So thank you for staying and being part of this insightful webinar. Don't forget to follow us on our social media handle for more insightful information. You know, I would like to appreciate everyone for joining us. Thank you and see you on the next um, webinar. Bye, everyone.